My guest today is Raj Krishnan. How are you, Raj? Hey, very nice to see you. Nice to see you in person. Yeah, it's been a while, isn't it? What are you doing these days? Actually, you know, if I told you I'm doing AI, they wouldn't be surprised. Right? Right? That's Lots what everybody's doing. doing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think now I'm focusing more and more on AI and particularly working with partners and customers, uh, trying to help them identify use cases mm -hmm. and also kind of making AI to be very... Uh, for an enterprise scenario rather than, hey, here is a chat GPT or here is a co-pilot, mm -hmm. but how do you solve a business problem and where do you inject AI and how do you kind of combine all of them together to solve a end-to-end -end business problem? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of hype around AI these yeah. days, and which is, it leads people to believe that it's a new technology, but it's not, is it? No, I mean, it is not because AI, as that term itself has started you know, a long time back. Decades right? ago. Yeah, where um, I, I still remember, you know, I used to run a call center. So we used AI to, because we used to have calls being dropped, and then we would call these people to come, and then we'll have to pay them four hours for coming in, and by the time they come, it would, uh, the call would, the uh, volume would go down. Mm -hmm. So what we did was we used integer programming, you know, linear programming to optimize based on the queue, Mm -hmm. to say that, hey, here is what you can expect based on the historical data. Right. And then, so it, these are all applications of AI, right? But what has uh, dramatically changed is the things that I told you about are more algorithmic, right? So mm -hmm. where you use an algorithm, so regression or prediction or clustering, right? What has dramatically changed with the language models is that, as a matter of fact, now things we used to think are very exclusive for algorithm, like let's say forecasting, right? We always start forecasting. I need to take a lot of historical data, and then I have a or whatever algorithm I want to use, and then I want to predict. But now there is something called time uh, GPT, right? Where mm -hmm. we are using even large language models to use, like you simply give the data, and it kind of uh, creates um, a forecast for you, which are pretty accurate, right? Okay. So without doing, so I think what has changed is the complexity of building an AI model where you need data scientists, parameter tuning, uh, data uh, variables, you know, uh, putting all that and uh, finding the right algorithm. Now you just simply lab, uh, depend on these uh, neural networks and models and you tell it what to do and it seems to do a good job of most of the things. Oh yeah, I think there's two factors that are going in this. One is that uh, we have access to so much more compute power than yeah. we ever had before because of, of these cloud services there where you can rent them. Uh, and the other is our friends over at Ape, OpenAI have done some really clever, creative things. Yeah, I mean, it's not really OpenAI. Like now, look, like Ms. Frelner, look at, like, there's a good, very healthy, competitive market. Right. And Microsoft is doing something great. You know, we typically used to always say, we come up with our own and wait until the market demands and then go say, oh, we are open source. But on the other hand, now we are taking a completely different approach. Mm -hmm. We support OpenAI, we'll support Llama, we'll support anything. We're creating endpoints uh, for uh, open source A models. Uh, I think what we are saying is, okay, but run it on our platform sure. because we give you so much security and other things, right? So it, it, there is not only um, the fact that uh, OpenAI, I mean, of course, still, uh, the GPT-4 is the king, right? When it comes to, in, when, you, when you try, like, you know, I've tried, uh, for, for example, a summarization or extract some entity from a text. You try different things, but GPT-4 or GPT-3.5 even, that's an outstanding job. There's still yet to, for me to say that somebody is doing better than uh, those models. Like, yeah. yeah, that's where some of the, uh, when I mentioned it, I call it OpenAI specifically because GPT is there model yeah. and these large language models are becoming so powerful right now and that's driving this generative AI revolution that we're seeing. Yeah, and, and, and what as, why the excitement is that things that used to take a, a big data science modeling effort is now reduced to you know, more of trying, for example, you know, the, what we call uh, retrieval augment generation where using vector embeddings for your corporate knowledge Mm -hmm. so that you could make the language model more for crafting a response within your context, right? So it is now, the, the goal is not about the model itself. The goal is how do I leverage this model very effectively for my enterprise data? Okay.
be the retrieval augmented generation. We call it the RAG model. Yes. To, to define that a little bit. Yeah, so see, there's a little bit of too much excitement and uh, disappointment as well, right? So typically, in the, the, the ability of the large language model is uh, to, uh, first of all, it was built to your point, you know, to cost $100 million or something to build based on the corpus, but it's as of September 21, right? right. With the data that was extracted from the internet, uh, but if you ask ChatGPT or anything, it never gives you a reference. Uh, you know that, right? It's because it's not based on a specific data. It's based on the neural network l learning um, and then uh, thing. And as a result, you know, you must have heard terms like hallucinations. It could even make <laughs> up things, right? right? It's because it's more of a language model, just like us. We make up things when we don't know something. So <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Raj. <laughs> uh, but, you know, but then you know, for us to... Uh, apply it to an enterprise scenario, we need to take an enterprise data, but use the language model for comprehension and crafting response, right? Okay. So the retrieval argument generation is about taking an enterprise data okay. and then telling it, hey, I don't want you to come up with your own, but give me uh, um, an answer based on the context that I'm uh, giving you. But the language model then takes this and crafts a nice response. Because if I just simply took my data it won't be uh, readable, right? Even to interpret it, what is needed. But it's a lot, big, big challenge. People think, oh, it solves the problem. No, it's not. They think that if I dump everything and create a rag, it'll answer. There are so many variables and so many things, and yet you can still get wrong answers from the language model. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, trying to give the context of the enterprise data. There are so many factors that you must, must have heard about token limitation. You cannot just right. dump the entire uh, context and ask it, to do and it's not only expensive and it cannot work right so there are a lot of techniques like vectorization so typically what we are doing is we are taking text and converting them into math right as a vector okay uh, of your company knowledge <clears throat> and then when a question is asked before we go to language model we take the question and look for vector similarity. Vector similarity. So turning turning these answers into numbers, those information into numbers. Yes. Then we can find numbers that are close to each other, and that close implies to each other. that those those that information is related to one. Yes. Another. And then with that, now I go to language model and say, hey, answer based on what I'm giving you, okay. right? So this way, it doesn't come up with its own, and also I'm not dumping my entire company knowledge to the language model to answer. But it's not very easy. There are so many factors that affect this. Like, for example, what do you vectorize? And then if it's a text, how do you chunk them? Because what happens is that when it's bigger size, you know, again, you, know, you cannot handle it. So what you need to do is you have to chunk them before you vectorize them. And the way you chunk them, size of the chunks, everything matters. And even more importantly, even with all this, your prompt still matters a lot. Right. right. So there are so many factors. So people who, th uh, who think, we see a demo with standard, they get palgrams, text, and then do a little demo that will be disappointed when they try to take their enterprise data and ask questions for which they want answer, right? So there is a lot of challenges, but it's, that is the only way that an enterprise can leverage this. Like, most people get excited about content generation. Oh, um, craft a response, right? But when it comes to enterprise, that's not what you're looking for, right? When, what you're looking for is that, okay, I'm working with some insurance clients. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is, okay, if I have this, based on this, show me a similar policy, right? Right, And say, then, how could I craft a policy based on my historical data, based on the similarity of a policy, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very enterprise-specific uh, data, mm -hmm. right? So those kinds of things are very challenging. And now there is a, another turn in that rag is that, what they call knowledge graph, right? So knowledge graph is, uh, uh, you know, we use Cosmos DB, we use mm -hmm. Neo4j, you must have uh, talked, uh, learned about nodes and indices, right? right? Where David knows me, and David also knows somebody, and he's an AI expert, and it kind of creates the knowledge graph. And the knowledge graph is based on a lot of rooted facts. So before we go to the rag, we want to go to this knowledge graph, which is a lot more deterministic about all the relationships, and then ground that, and then now we use RAG. So there's a lot of uh, focus on combining knowledge graph uh, with the retrieval augment generation. So, you talk, yeah, you talk about a lot of technologies. What If I want to start building solutions using artificial intelligence, uh, what are the skills that I need to have? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty challenging, and I can tell you that 
uh, my hair is getting grayer because of the number of new things that comes. Right? <laughs> uh, it's because if, uh, like, you look at it, Microsoft itself, right, has so many open source and internal, right? Mm -hmm. So we have in uh, Open AI Studio with uh, AI Assistant. Right. But on the other hand, we have something called Autogen, which is a phenomenal agent-based uh, system, which is completely open source. People are raving about it as. But I, have, I have not seen that. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> the Autogen is kind of an agent-based where you create agents to do m multiple things, okay. and they talk to each other and automatically find the way to do and communicate. Hmm. You'll be surprised where you'll say, hey, you, you'll be an agent that whose job is to go search the web content. So the user will say, yeah, I want you to go, go to this website, scrape all the content. Hmm. And once the content, there's another agent that says, okay, vectorize this created. And you don't even write a program. They write the code hmm. for you and then talk to each other. And when it doesn't meet, it goes back and corrects itself. Nice. It's, it's unbelievable. Right? So there are so many tools. We have something called semantic kernel, which is amazing, yeah. right? Which is also a kind of an agent-based system with using um, you know our own, and it works with the .NET, uh, you know, and it's got a lot of uh, powerful things that you can do. Then of course, OpenAI itself. Then there is Llama Index. There is Langchain. All of them are very, very powerful. So my job is now trying to looking at this, trying different things, and also cost is a factor, right? Sure. Cost is Always. factor. Like you, just because, like you'll be surprised. Let's say if you want to use GPT four, and even the cost difference between GPT four and GPT three point five, there is a difference in results. But you don't just blindly go into GPT four because it's pretty expensive at this point, right? right? So finding out uh, will will I get a similar results on open uh, open source model, or uh, do I have to? Where do I have to? Can I do combination of these things to reduce cost? And can I just use like for example, you know, I t told you about chunking the text. You know, I recently found in the Lama index they have called semantic chunking, which is a dynamic chunking. What it does is it looks at the con uh, content mm -hmm. and tries to say, okay, this I can group into a one chunk, so it gives me more context. But this one, it's too big, so I'm going to divide it. But when I divide it, I'll make sure I group all the relevant content in this chunk. Okay. Because when you chunk, or well, something is here, something is here, then it, to relate them as a the similar content becomes challenging, right? So there are a lot of uh, uh, complications uh, when you do this uh, before we create our rag, but there are so many things that are coming up. So uh, what I've been doing is trying everything, see what that uh, what works, and then uh, you know uh, try to build a solution. Uh, this is going to be intimidating to a lot of people watching this that yes. haven't started yet. Yes, uh, they're not going to go out and they're going to learn, learn every single piece of technology you talked about. Where yeah. would you recommend people, yeah, people so, start? Yeah, you don't have to do all this, right? Like, look for example, you could take now. The good news is, so there are so many tools that are available. So, I just uh, there is recently something that is uh, pretty promising. Uh, it's called Task Weaver, okay. right? I don't know that. Uh, that's a what it is is you could actually go and tell it. I want to do this, and then it creates a plan and writes a program for you. Hmm. So uh, we a have computer seen, language program. I, like, program. In, uh, we can say Python. You okay. know, that's what we've been using. So you could say that okay, I need to create a program um, that will um, you know uh, that will uh, to vectorize uh, a text, and then it'll come up. You could even specifically say I want to use let's say face vector uh, hmm. store or uh, Chroma or. You know, you could actually give it instruction, and then it starts with the plan. And you know, I recently did one and say, "Hey, I want to get the, all the textual content from uh, the websites, mm -hmm. uh, provided I give you a base website." Okay. And so I'll say, "Okay, give me your website," and takes it, runs the code, and gives you like a use beautiful soup. It writes the code for you. Okay. And, and it's almost like yes, I mean that is so people can actually leverage a lot of these tools, all right. including GitHub Copilot and uh, sure. uh, Copilot Chat is amazing, right? It even understands your context. Where let's say if I'm in a dot .py program, and you know, like I would say that okay, I want to create a JSON from this mm -hmm. with this uh, JSON schema structure. It immediately gives you. Uh, the code that you, uh, you you want to write, right? So, uh, to your, to answer your point, yeah, will I do I'll jump into all of them? No, it's a progression. And once you in there, you're going to say, oh, there's one in Llama Index. I want to try this, or I want to use Langchain. But I would start then. In order, there is also Microsoft itself is doing a lot of these 
low code, no code type of solutions, right? Where sure. uh, within, now we have an OpenAI studio, oh, yeah. uh, your co own data. Co copilot studio. Copilot, copilot studio. AI studio yeah, to do your right. own data for completely abstracting a lot of this yeah. chunking and using AI search as the, okay. your, so there are, you can start out with out of the box tools okay. and then get into a more advanced tools. Maybe if you want to do a lang chain or if you want to do, um, you know, other standard Python semantic kernel or, um, you know, Langsmith and Lama. There are so many of them. But you don't have to start from all of them. You can start with something very simple. Like even if you look at Copilot Studio, right? It's, it's, it's very sophisticated now with plugins to create a conversational with your own data. Right. So you could start and then once you know if there's a limitation, no, I want to customize this, personalize it, then you can do some of these uh, researches. Uh, I see. So your recommendation is uh, start with some of these low code tools, yeah. uh, learn the concept of yes. it, and yeah. then maybe use some of these uh, the code generation tools to learn what the programs themselves look like. Yeah. And from that, you can go, uh, I, I wouldn't use the code generation tool to generate production code, final production code, but it's a great starting point. It's a, and it's a good learning tool. If I don't know Python, if I don't know yeah. how to build a model, it'll, it'll get me, I can look at the code generated and get an idea. But you believe it in that, it, it, the code that generated is better than I would ever why would I? If I it's not because I, I'm a good coder or bad coder. Like every line is with a comment, right? Oh, what okay. it's doing. That's why the learning is really good. I yeah, mean, it's a good I place mean, to start yeah. So then, then you may say, well, anybody can write. No, but you need to ask the right question, right. break the problems into segments that make sense, and then leverage that, right? So it's not, the only thing it's taking away is that I would have, okay, I need to do this, okay, I need to write a, a context for writing a file. What is the syntax? I know I'd have to struggle and I'll go to look at, do a stack flow, but now I just ask it, hey, what's the syntax to write this into an output file? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's where I see a lot of that. In Copilot, I use GitHub Copilot a lot. Yeah. And often it'll, first it'll save me typing, but I never trust it 100%. And that's, because it, it's, it's usually pretty good. Yeah. Gets me eighty percent of the way there. That's still my responsibility to look at. You, it yeah, as, sure. as an architect, and, and that's, that's why right. I don't look at it as a job killer. I, I yeah. kill it as a job aid. Exactly. And where ultimately we make the decisions, and then it's not may not be up to date too, right? So there are there are you can you should use it carefully. That's my point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, that's why I'm glad we called it co. Uh, that, yes. Because we are the pilot still. Yes. It? Yes. Yes, I think that's a very good way of uh, putting it. Yeah. I think it's a great overview. People get started with that, and um, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's great to be at these times, right? Because such a transformational technology that's that's happening, and then you, there is a big community and friends who are really working together to build better solution. And I see an openness that I've never seen before. Like, there's not, nobody's trying to sell everything to you. Everybody's trying to, hey, here's a different way of doing things. And a lot of open source activities and uh, uh, companies that are being supported by uh, uh, investors to build open source solutions. Eventually they'll make money, but it's a great time now for everybody to be in the AI field and build solutions.